Luke chapter 5 and verse 18. And behold, men brought in a man, a bed, a man which was taken with palsy. They sought means to bring him in, to lay him before him. And they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitudes. They went up on the housetop, let him down through the tiling of his, with his couch or his pallet into the midst before Jesus. And when he, Jesus, saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaks blaspheme? Who can forgive sins but God only? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, what reason, why, re, why, what reason you are, why reason you in your heart? Whether it's easy to say, your sins be forgiven, you are to say, rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up your couch, go into your house. And to me, he rose up before them, took up that whereon he lay, departed to his own house, glorifying God. They were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Great and wonderful God of Israel, we know you the Almighty, and beside you there is no Savior, there is no God. We have accepted you as Jesus Christ upon this earth. We received you as Jesus. For Jesus has taught if we receive him, we receive you. And I from my heart have re accepted Jesus Christ and his shed blood for the perpetuation of my sins and the substitution of my life and my soul. Cover me with that blood that was shed at Calvary. Cleanse me and wash me. Give us the unction of the Holy Ghost. God, give us your blessings, your grace, your mercy, and your love. All in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, by faith we ask. Amen. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, your sins are forgiven you, or rise up and walk. Jesus Christ sees our faith. You'll find in the book of Hebrews, 11 and 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith is God's way of helping us to touch him. That's why a Romans 12 and 3 said, God has dealt or given to every man the measure of faith, because without it, we can't touch him. Faith without works is dead, or works without faith is dead. Either way, you can have works, if you don't have no faith with it, that's dead. Or you can have faith and don't have no works, that's dead. As the body without the spirit is dead, James said the faith without works, faith without corresponding action. you got to have actions. The, most of the time, the reason people ain't healed, preachers, they know how to minister healing. You know, Jesus knew how to minister healing to us. He knew what to tell us to do for us to get healed. Not only did he tell us to have faith, he also told us how to use faith. I mean, faith is good, but if you know how to use it, and I've seen the time, I didn't know how to use it. You know, I knew I believed in God. I believed in God since I was 11 years old. When God gave me my own life miracle, when Jesus come to me in a vision and said, I'm Jesus and I've come to heal you, and I was instantaneously healed from, an in, from a hopeless cripple. I knew God's power. I knew God's miracles. I knew I couldn't walk. I knew I couldn't live. I knew I was dying. And I knew that I was skinny bones. I knew that God was my only hope. I heard the doctors tell my mom, the only, only hope is power from on high. Thank God there's power from on high. The power from on high. 
verse 17 said it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees, doctors of the law, setting by which was come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to him. Now the Bible said everywhere that Jesus went, he was doing good, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all. Every place Jesus went, he never went anywhere. He never preached anywhere. He never taught anywhere. He never walked anywhere. But the power of God and the manifestation of faith was dormant in his life. If we've got the power, it's dormant. Jesus told us preachers to wait until we're endued with power from on high. And his apostles done just that. His apostles went and waited in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost came. So, well, I've got the Holy Ghost. Well, you may have something they say is the Holy Ghost, but the Bible said the kingdom of God is not meat and drinks, but it's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Again, he said, the kingdom of God is not in word. Now, he told us what the, whole, what the kingdom is. He said the kingdom of God is the Holy Ghost. So now he's saying the Holy Ghost is not in word. The kingdom is not in word, but in power. Yes. Not in word only, but in power. Yes. Paul said in 116 of Romans, the gospel of Christ is the power of God in action to everyone that believes, both Jews and Gentiles. Everywhere Jesus went, the power was present. If the church could somehow get back to the power, then the sick is going to stop being healed. Oh, we think, you know, you cut on TV, you see all this saying, all these people supposed to be worshiping God on TV and all these TV ministers, but there's no power. I believe it's like Jesus said, they worship him with their lips, but their hearts ain't in it. He said in Luke 17, the kingdom of God come not of observations. That's observations. All this stuff we're seeing, that's outward show. The kingdom of God come not with what you see. It's not of observation, but it's within you. Yes. See, that's Jesus. When is the kingdom of God? And then again he said, Mark 91, some of you will be sitting right here, standing right here, and you will not see the power of the kingdom till it comes. You'll not see until the kingdom of God is come in power. We need the kingdom of God, the Holy Ghost, to come in power. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. I want to be anointed with power. The power is not with us. If we set our hearts, God told me if a man in this time, a preacher in this time, would set his heart and seek God with all of his heart, God would be found. That's what Jeremiah 29, 11 says in 12. In the day you seek with all your heart, I will be found of you. David found him when he sought him with all his heart. Isaiah found him said, I saw the Lord. Paul found him, you know, and came out with power. Jesus went into the wilderness and he found the power of the kingdom because the Bible said he returned into Galilee. He returned in the power of the Spirit. And from that day, everywhere Jesus went, because the power was with him, the sick was healed. Devils was cast out. Evil diseases were driven out. America don't have the power anymore. That's the reason faith don't work. We're trying to have faith, but there's no power. You can get a good-looking automobile, but if the thing's half stopped up, you know, we, we just got a bus over there, and the thing would start up a hill, the, the fuel line got busted up. You know, the busted, and the fuel was, was just getting, uh, wasn't getting enough fuel. Get going up in mountains, and it quit. Didn't have no power. That's what's wrong. The fuel line between you and God stopped up. 
Every time you get start up a hill, need power, ain't none there. Right. You know, when you start to pray for the sick, you you good, you give a good prayer, Amen. but there's no power in it. You know, Samson, he rose up as he did before, and he shook himself, but the power wasn't there. Before time, he used to rise up and shake himself, but he had a dedication. He was a Nazarite to God. God had given him a sign gifted ministry. God gave him a sign of his power. God told him his miracle, his power was in his dedication. But he lost his dedication to Delilah. And the Bible said he rose and shook himself as he did before. But the Spirit of the Lord did not come upon him. The power of the Lord this time did not come. It failed him. The power of God has failed the church in this hour because they have lost their dedication. They've lost their prayer. They've lost their consecration. You made a dedication to God that you would pray regardless. But now you don't pray. You made a dedication you would fast, that you would pray, that you would have a good relationship with God. But you got caught up in fast and cares of life and you can't pray. You don't have time. The power of God, the power of the Lord was present to heal everywhere Jesus went. When I got to Bombay, Sister Taylor and I, and Brother and Sister West, and Brother Bill and Brother Dave, Brother Bordet, Dr. Bordet met us and gave me an itinerary, and I guess he, they probably may have already had one, and I stuck in my pocket and got to the had to stay a few hours in the hotel. We had to catch another flight on in East India. Uh, East India. While Brother West then went to pick up the equipment, we went and preached a crusade because it took a week for them to get everything together, and we preached a crusade in Eastern India. I got to the room. I looked at the itinerary, and I began to see where we was going, what cities. I saw a city that I told them three years ago that I didn't want to go to. I told them last year I didn't want to go to it. I told them the year before I didn't want to go there because I'd heard that they were uh, in that area, and it was lots of persecution. In fact, about it, the week before we David got there, uh, an Indian minister called me from down south, said, you need to be careful because I just the, saw that. He said, you see the headlines of the news today? And I said, no. He said, the headline of the news today was that some other ministers from America is, is being in, in some serious persecutions in that area. That whole entire area in there, they don't want the gospel of Jesus preached. And so some of them has been bodily hurt. And I said, well, praise God, that's good news. And that's the reason I didn't want to go in that part. But I didn't say nothing, but I didn't feel too good about it. But see, God had it all in his hands. You know, God. It was the door God opened. Some other ministers had come in there and tried to have a meeting, spent about $100,000 and didn't work. We didn't have but $5,000 to invest in a meeting. So praying up on the hotel, the Lord told me, he said, it's going to be all right. He said, the power of the Lord is going to be present in this city to heal. Amen. Hallelujah. See, that's what we need. That's the key. We don't have the power. We may have the jerks. Samson got up and shook himself, but it wasn't nothing there. Y'all remember years ago I saw a vision at the Pentecost where people going to wake up one morning shaking and talking in tongues and have nothing to go with it. Where is the power, God asked me. Where is the power? I'll tell you where it is. Hey, Alan told us that years ago. The power of God is in paying the price. You remember that old book, The Price of God's Miracle Work and Power he put out in the early 50s or late 40s? Because our, you know, is that, in those days, A. Allen, they called him the God's man of faith and power. And, he, and it was proved to be so. He backed it up. A man told me he came to Oklahoma City way back in the early 50s, put up a big old giant tent, said that people that had stretchers back there laying in, a, in a, an emergency tent, said they just bring them out, bring them out, and pull them right up on the platform. The ramp said he'd get out of the side and cry a little bit and pray and they'd get up and go home. 
a little church God preacher told me that. He, he was a state evangelist in Oklahoma. Sent out here from Georgia, stayed out here a year, and attended some of them meetings of some Jack Cord, some of them men. He come back to me and he said, Man, said they got preachers out there in Texas and Oklahoma. They raised the dead. <laughs> so they got so much power, they can raise the dead. Hallelujah. Said, I've seen people come in there cut open with cancer, laying wide open. They'd pray for them. They'd close up and jump up and go home. Hallelujah. But all of these preachers will tell you there was a price to pay. There was a price to pay. Men ain't paying the price anymore. God told me we'll pay the price. He will pay the price. Go away. The power is yours. God has been helping me this year to really get my prayer life. I've always prayed, but sometimes prayer is just words and not prayer. I've always said words to God. <laughs> I was always hollering at him. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> you know, <laughs> had you always hollered at him? I've always hollered at him. I've always hollered, help me, Jesus. Yes. God, do something for me. Yes, and there's always hollered at him. Yes, I've always hollered at him. Yes. But sometimes that's all we've been doing, just like screaming at each other. You start screaming at your husband, he'll scream back. <laughs> Next thing you know, he'll say, get off my back. Yeah, you get off mine. <laughs> Man, <laughs> you know. That don't work with God. I don't, you don't scream at God not in that manner. It's all right to get emotional and scream because you're mostly faith and desperate, but not in a manner. God, like he's on demand. God ain't on demand to nobody. Man, he's God. He's not on demand. And I was praying on top of the hotel. God said, don't be afraid. He said, the power of the Lord. The coordinator of the Meeting said, you don't have to come to about 7 o'clock. Well, about 10 to 7 is only about 10, 5 or 10 minutes from the hotel to get to where the meeting was. I told Sister Terry and Brother Summer, I said, let's go. I want to get on over there. They started at 6.30. We got over, and I guess we probably got there. He told me we didn't have to leave the hotel. It wouldn't take service about 7 to 7.30. But we pull up on the grounds. We looked out there, and it looked like they, they, nobody had no crowds in this place. But they looked like there were about 50 to 60,000 people. They were singing. Oh, when we got out of the van, it was like the glory was in the singing. I knew. I felt. It's like it was time I, you know, I was preaching up in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, back in the 50s. Had a 60 by 120 tent. I might not have had but 60 by 90 up down in Arkadelphia. I heard that a a man of God had a big giant tent in Little Rock. And I'd been preaching about three or four weeks, and I kept hearing, you know, which was Arkansas is only about 70, 80 miles. What's going on? Some of them slip up and come back and say, boy, they're having a meeting up down in Little Rock. And I asked the, one of the pastors of that area, I said, I said, would you preach Sunday night for me? He said, what you going to do? I said, I, I want to go to that meeting in Little Rock. I want to go to that big tent in Little Rock. He said, okay. I got in my car and I drove up to Little Rock, found the place real easy, had to park way back, got out of the car, I mean, I had time finding a place, so many cars, got out of the car, and I could hear them singing in that old big giant tent, coals of fire, cold chills went up my spine as I was walking towards that tent. I felt the power. Hallelujah. As I walked closer Finally walked on the edge of the tent. It just felt like that place was being penetrated with God's power. Like my body was being illuminated. And finally the preacher looked back, saw me back there, and I guess he knew I was a preacher. And he motioned for me to come to the platform. I maybe sent someone, maybe a, I believe some guy with a, a blonde spot in his head, a great he's black, anybody had a, like a, a bleach. But it was a normal thing. Came back there. Said, won't you come to the platform? I went to the platform. I, I thought, I can't sit on that platform. It's too much glory. I knew it was a power. I was just scared. 
I absolutely was shaking. As I got on that platform, I, I didn't feel worthy to be on that platform. I was shaking. And so, for some reason, he turned around and said, I want this young man to come up here and testify. I went up there and I didn't say much, but I got the microphone. And my body just started burning. And I don't know what all I said, but it was like fire had anointed me for two or three minutes to testify. And I sat in. He turned and looked at me. And he told me, he said, one day you're going to be preaching on the biggest gospel tent in the world. I mean, power was in that place. After a while, they, he preached and don't know what they've done. I don't remember what all happened, but I know is they begin to lay hands on the sick. He wasn't just laying hands on the sick. It was like God's power was present. Hallelujah. Glory. And mean to tell me that there was no shortage of miracles that night. But you know there's a shortage of miracles in our day. But there's no shortage of miracles that night. You didn't have to come expecting to see some. Go home and thought I thought I'd seen some, but I didn't see nothing. Your eyes was always filled with miracles. Your ears always heard what it took to make a miracle. See, that faith would just jump it in your heart, jump it in your ear. Faith come by it. hearing, and hearing by the word of God is like faith was coming out of what you said right into your ears and right into your heart. You knew that God was going to do something. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Later on, as God put me in big tents, I've had people to tell me. I heard them testify when I stepped on the tent grounds where Brother Terrell was preaching. I felt the power. When he took the microphone, I felt coals of chills go up my spine. You know why? God was in them big old tents in the late 60s, in the 70s. Hallelujah. In the early 60s, as God put them in big tents. 1906, the power is there. But something has happened. Something has happened to the church in America. Something has happened. We've got all this promotion. We don't have to pay no more. It's all television exposure. It's all emotion. But God ain't promoting. Back in those days, television won the promotion. God said promotion comes not by man. Come not by yeast. Come not by where. But from the Lord, God was promoting. I remember that I, down in South Alabama, I just closed a meeting, 1960, and I heard there was gonna, that William Bynum was going to be in Dallas, Texas at a Voice of Healing Convention. I was moving the tent, and I had about 10 days. We just went in our first big giant tents. I decided I'd take off, and I'd drive to Dallas. So I went out and got on Highway 80, cut across there, got on Highway 80, and I drove all the way to Dallas. Got there, oh, I knew W.B. Grant. Got there, went by his house. He said, you can stay with us. I went down that night to that meeting in Raymond T. Ritchie. That first night I went, he was preaching. But when I walked under that big old giant tent, I felt the power of God. Then another one of the voice of healing preachers. But I went out there to see William Branham. He was coming in. What about the third night, William Branham? He walked to the platform. I was sitting in the audience when he walked to the platform. Everybody was standing. I started crying. It was like Jesus Christ had walked to that platform. I felt the presence, the power of God. Brother Branham was a quiet little fellow, but he began to preach. And after a while, they gave the altar call. People got saved. They prayed the sinner's prayer. And they started singing, Only Believe. Stretchers was laying all around. I could feel the very power, and I could feel it over that audience. Brother Branham just began to look back at people on stretchers. He would reveal their names, the doctors and the hospitals and the conditions, and he would say, you're healed. Your faith makes you whole. They just get off of those stretchers. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Glory. Other, other conditions. The power of the Lord was there. And it was there to heal. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. I walked up on that lot in Jovapoo, North India. 
They were singing. God spoke to me. He said, the power of God is in this city to heal. Don't be afraid. I told Sister Taylor, I said, honey, God's going to move here. Like we hadn't seen God move here. You know, I didn't know that this wasn't just now. Hallelujah. I didn't know what was going to come out of this. Thank you, Jesus. Went out and I preached on. Jesus saw their faith. About 10, 15, 20,000 came up and got saved. Started the prayer line. The deaf. The mute. The first person I ministered, I believe, was someone dying with cancer. They were healed. God began to heal. The deaf spoke as though they were not dumb or deaf. Other healings. And then it, they began to push. They began to press. So we knew we had to start the prayer line. Started the prayer line. All day the next day, I couldn't get away from that scripture. The power of the Lord. So I was trying to preach something else. I want to preach on Jesus took our infirmities. Because you've got to sh- preach to him Jesus. Jesus took our infirmities. And by our sickness. But just before service, I, went in, I, I thought it was in the seventh chapter of, of uh, Luke. I looked. Just about read the whole chapter. I said, well, it ain't there. I called Sister Taylor. I said, honey, uh, before we leave, we fix and leave, I said, I got to have that scripture. The power of the Lord is present to heal. I said, it's in Luke. I thought it was in 7. Well, she grabbed her Bible. About a minute, she said, it's Luke 5. And I turned over and I read it and I underlined it. Went on down and keep reading about these men. You know, Mark said four men. And so I went out and I read that one scripture. The power of the Lord is present. And I told him what God told me. That if the power of the Lord, the power of God was there to heal, to save, to feel. And I emphasized that all through the message. Quoting other scriptures. Don't even believe I read the other. And not to them, but I did. I marked it. And about 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 25 minutes into the message, I felt the urge inside of me. To run, and both uh, my interpreter and I both we had cordless mics, and I ran down into the audits, ran down through the sick part, the sick and the invalid area, ran on down about 50 feet, and I began to preach. And he was standing beside me, he was preaching. The mic was still picking up, it was preaching, and I said, "The power of God!" And the people began to bump, their hands was up, and they just you could just see the, the like wind hitting them. And it just looked like they just they had a rope down the aisles. And was, this was the second night. It was about 60, 75,000 people was there. And it just looked like they was a, the, the, the volunteers was trying to keep, like the people was trying to get up there. Well, coming back, I started walking back. And those seats up front was just about back there, maybe near about to the door. And I started back into my right. As I was walking back to the platform, still preaching, urging them, I was going to go back through that sick section and really urge them because I felt like maybe as it got another, some of them cripples would be healed. As I looked over there, I saw four men coming. Saw four men coming. Hallelujah. This changed my life. It's done so. I've seen four men coming. And I just marked it just. A few minutes before I left the room and read it. Read it in the Bible. Four men coming. Looked at it. Had a man. Four men was bringing a man in. Looked like a board. Like the bear. They bear them on them boards over there. But it was a little, like a helmet stretcher. But they had poles, you know. And each man had a pole. And this man, he was, they had his arm folded. He was laying there. His eyes were shut. He wasn't moving. And the first thing I knew, I said, this man is dead. I know he's dead. But I, I was, didn't know what to do. I was about down here, just getting about down here. And I just, I was watching them, really listening to the voice of the Spirit. And I started up, you know, and I thought, well, I'll just rush on, get on the platform. But did, I just felt the power, the power, I felt the power. And it just, the way I was preaching, it just like like God had to do something. Something had to happen. They brought him, and just as I got right there to make my turn, they laid him down at my feet. And I reached down, I felt. I didn't feel no movement. I didn't feel no life. 
I just looked up and I raised my right hand to heaven and I said, Oh God in heaven, send your power, send your, send your life of God into this man. Raise him up. Send your life from God in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Send life from God into him and make him whole. That moment I just felt something inside of me said, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and go home. When I said that, he leaped off of that stretcher. And he ran into the audience. I said he ran into the audience. Glory. He ran into the audience. Made home. Hallelujah. He ran into the audience. And when he did, about 50,000 people rushed that platform. And I looked up on the platform. Everybody on the platform had ran to the front. And they were, so everybody cried. My wife and everybody. Of course, she was always standing there. You know, and, and you know, watching me see if I would, wanted to come down there. And everybody was crying. Sister West was way back over in the corner, and she ran, and everybody, everybody just ran up to the front. They was bawling. The pastors, tears were rolling down the cheeks, and all of these cripples. They just brought a woman in. Some women had brought a, a general's wife. There's a hopeless cripple. She jumped up out of her chair, and she started running. People in these cripples started jumping up. They started healing. They saw they saw the power, and I said, yeah, the power is here. People in the audience, people everywhere. It was just like God was raining power, power, and God was speaking to me. God said, the power of the Lord is restored. The power of God is coming back. The power of the Lord Lord is present. He said, everywhere I went, hallelujah, ah, the power went with me. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. And the power of God began to go through them people and make them whole. And I was standing over here. We had a high platform. There was a man over here. Had a boy about eight or nine or ten years old. He was born blind. Of course, when all that happened, they all rushed trying to get to the blind. He rushed up there. And I guess he probably held that boy up with his hands like that up around the waist. And he must have told him, you know, in his, in his native language, to touch me. That little old boy reached out and I felt something grab my britcher leg my trouser leg. When he did, that little boy began to scream. I, I can see. I can see. And the man put him up on the platform. The little boy began to jump. And he began to jump. And he said, I can see. 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 Hallelujah. I said to him, I said, what is he saying? He said, I can see. I can see. I can see. Hallelujah. Everybody crying. The power the power of God. Hallelujah. God spoke to me right there. I had to turn it to one of the preachers to pray with them. I called people just was praying. And they were just, you know, they bombarded the heaven. Their hands were up. Just for a moment or two. And I was crying. Because I knew that they was rushing. We had to, people had to accept Christ because they was rushing to get prayer out of control God told me I said this is what America needs this is what America oh, he said in order for Christianity to survive in America the power has got to come back Christianity can't survive it ain't surviving Christianity is going down it's corrupt churches are corrupt preachers are corrupt preachers are corrupt we've lost we've lost the church is in sin the church God right there spoke to me said America and the churches of America has gone back to paganism they've taken on the gods of the heathen they've taken on the gods of the pagans and God spoke to me hallelujah right there something inside of me made me hungry. Something inside of me made me thirst. Hunger for what? Hunger for God's power. I want God's power. I gotta have God's power. We got to have the power. We got to have the restored of God's power. Without it, we can't survive. Hallelujah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's what's got to happen to Mary, and that's what's going to happen. God's power is coming back to the body of Jesus Christ. God's power is coming back to the church of Jesus Christ, the church of God, the church of the Almighty God. God's coming back to the, His church. He's coming back to His people. If His people, which are called by His name, will pray and seek His face and turn from the wicked ways and get their dedication and forsake their sin, He said, forsake your wicked ways. It's worth it. I want to live a sanctified life and have God's power and live a worthy life and not. Sanctification means separating from the world, separating from sin, and lay aside every weight and every sin that does easy beset you. We've got so much weight. We've got so much sin. And I'd rather be dead. I absolutely had rather be dead than not to have the power. I, 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 I told God, I said, God, I'm tired of you know, God told me, said, preachers ain't nothing but machines. They're not men of God anymore. They're machines. They're machines. They're computers. They're nothing but workshops. They're nothing but actors. They're nothing but promoters. They use their, their eloquence of speech. They know how to speak. They use their eloquence of words. But Paul said, I come not to you with eloquent with words, but I come to you in demonstration of the Spirit. And a power that your faith should not stand in all this mess, but in the power of God. These people's faith was elevated into the power of God. Into the power of God. One night they brought a man in, a young boy, he looked to be about 20 or 22 years old. He was in shackles. When they go mad or crazy over there, they put him in chains. They put him in shackles and put a big old padlock like you'd lock up your bicycle or your front door with had him locked with it. He was totally mad. They had him down. I said, bring him up to the platform. So his brother, I presume his brother, sort of looked like his brother. He looked to be about 26 or 27 years old. They brought him up. This man was so mad and so violent till he was dangerous. Sister Terrell anointed him, and, and I laid my hands up on him. I said, you foul spirit of insanity. I said, you foul demon of hell, come out of him in the name of Jesus. And now it's really funny. Brother Terry was standing right here, and his brother was standing right there. He was standing right next to his brother, you know. Brother Terry was standing right here, and, and the man was right here, and his brother was right here. And I said, come out of him in the name of Jesus. And now it's just like that. The man's hand shot up, and he was free. When he did, the demons went into his brother. And he went into a demonic mad spirit, mad fit. And the brother, brother Terry, boy, he, he never seen nothing like that. You know, it shocked him. That demon went in him, and I had to leave him before I could get, to, get, get him unlocked and lay my hands upon him and command the demons to come out of him and just, just the demons only stayed in him just probably 30 seconds, enough to scare everybody to death. Boy, he went into, I mean, he went into some kind of, <laughs> he went into some kind of a maniac right there for a moment. <laughs> I mean, for a moment, I almost got scared, <laughs> you know? I mean, it was just, uh, you know, it was a scary situation. Most people would turn and run, <laughs> you know? And there have been a few times I felt like running. But if I knew it did, the devil would be chasing me the rest of my life. But in a split second, he was free. And I said, where's the key? He said, it's right here. And he reached in his pocket. And I unlocked the key and got them shackles off of him. The young man raised his hands, lifted him to heaven, a smile on his face, kissed my hand. They both walked off. I said, your faith has made you whole. Go. Go in peace. Hallelujah. They left because this what wasn't the day with Jesus. You know what happened? You may not know this. See, the devil knows. Jesus was going by a cemetery. One of the apostles said two men lived in the tombs. But Mark said there was a maniac. He only recorded one, but not that wasn't another one. And this man come running down out of the tombs, and he got right up in the presence of Jesus, and he started shaking. And he said, I know who you are. You know, he thought Jesus was a man. But when he got in his presence, he realized that the, he was in the presence of God's power. He knew when he got in the presence of God's power, he couldn't stay. He said, don't cast me out. In, into the atmosphere, didn't he? 
Don't cast me out up there into the atmosphere where I'll be miserable, where I'll be uh, going forth looking for, uh, you know, the Bible says, an unclean spirit's cast out of you. He, he's a raging, going forth, seeking rest, finding none. Don't cast me out out there where I'll be miserable. The Satan is miserable when he's cast out. He has to have a man's body, to, the faculties of a man's body to operate. So Satan can't do nothing if man didn't yield themselves to him. That's why Satan doing his dirty stuff, man yields himself to him. And Jesus, he said, let me go into them swine. Jesus said, gave him leave, said, go. The Bible said the man at that instant was restored to his sanity. He wore no clothes. Jesus gave him some clothes. He put some clothes on. He wanted to follow Jesus. Jesus said, go back home. The man lived in the tomb, said, go back home. Go back home to your house. Your family's wanting you, needs to see you. And he'd be home with your wife and kids and tell them what great things. The Bible said he went back to the capitals. And you, you'll find in the, the 16th chapter, I believe it is, 15 to 16th chapter of Matthews, where all that great multitude was healed. And Jesus went into the capitals. Well, that man went on ahead of him. The Bible said he went throughout all cities in that area, publishing, started evangelistic crusades, started preaching what great things God had done for him. When Jesus came in later, history says, in that same area, great multitudes. You'll find it there. Matthew 15 or 6, I believe it's 15. You'll find there that great multitude was healed was because of that man's testimony from Mark 9, I believe it is, or 8 or 9, what is it? How, uh, 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 Matthew's. Because of God's power. Amen. See, that's what Jesus said here. When he sees your faith, his power is so powerful. Men are operating without power. One day, one of the team came to me and told me, said, they got a the, the night watchman here at the hotel. Son is insane. For the last 10 years, he's lived in the tombs. said, he wants to know if he could get you to go to the graveyard, to the cemetery, and pray for him. I said, no. I said, Jesus didn't go to the graveyard. I said, you tell him to go and get him. They said, he can't. He's mad. He's crazy, can't handle him. I said, tell him to tie him up, get enough people, and capture him. Bring him, and we'll pray for him. So, I told him about two hours went by. I was fixing to go up, and the phone rang, and they told me, said, he's down here and now in the lobby. I said, well, bring him up to your room. So I went in, and they had him there. I just went on and got on my knees. I said, God, I remember you, Jesus. You delivered a man in the tomb. I said, here, 1,900 years later, here's another man that lives in the tombs. Break this yoke. Free this man. And I put my hand on his knee. Reached over and took his hand while I was praying. While I was praying, I reached and put my arms around him. And, you know, even though he was insane and demon says he, like he, he felt like he, it seemed like he felt like he could, he could feel it. You know what I'm talking? He could feel, even though he was insane, he could feel my love. To be honest, I was a little, you know, I, was, I knew the man was violent. I knew he could harm me. I knew that in a case like that, a demon like that, it'd take a dozen men, and still they couldn't handle him. Sometimes there ain't enough manpower to stop when he's evil spirit. These demons said people are strong. A kid sometimes can be so demon set till, till a grown-up. I've seen grown-ups wrestle with little kids, but he, he didn't act up. I laid my hands upon him, told him, look, he wouldn't look up. He had his head down. I commanded him. He lifted his head up. And I commanded him in the name of Jesus to be free and the devils to come out and him to confess Jesus. In a moment's time, he confessed Jesus Christ. He was free, raised his hands up, smiled, got right up out of that chair, went over and put his arms around his daddy, and embraced one of the tears. I said, take him home. He's whole. He turned around and put his arms around me, the smile on his face, and his daddy turned around and said, that's the first time the man has smiled or spoke to me, or even spoke a word. He told him, begin to talk to his daddy and tell him he loved him. In 10 years, it was God's presence of his power. You know, if we can get back in his presence again, back in his presence again, something's got to happen. Yeah. Something's got to happen, not only here in America, but the world. Yeah. With the world. The world is sick. Everybody's sick. 
If Jesus, if the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world, it can't be this mess that missionaries is preaching. It's got the gospel of the kingdom is what? Jesus said it's not in word, but it's in power. Hallelujah. It's not in meat. It's not in piety, but it's in joy, peace, and righteousness, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's in power. It's not in eloquent of words, but in power. Power and the demonstration of the Spirit. Paul said, I come to you in the demonstration of the Spirit and power of God. The power has got to come back. And God has shown me any man of God that's truly called. This is what he said. If anyone is truly called of God, they'll turn back to me and wait and seek my face and pay the price. The power will return. If you're called of God tonight or the hand of God's on your life, or if you claim to be a disciple of God, I want you to come and stand around this platform and I want you to reach out to God for his power.